Welcome to the Church Safety and Security Broadcast with the Church Safety Guys, sponsored by Checker. Background screens for your faith or volunteer organization. The Church Safety Guys is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to inspire, influence, and impact church safety and security teams. We are protectors, guardians, ambassadors, and shepherds. We are about all things church safety and security, which starts with a ministry mindset and a servant's heart. Join us for the next hour as the Church Safety Guys unpack safety, security, leadership, and ministry operations with your hosts, James McGarvey, Paul Buckner, and Mike Scully. This broadcast is also available on social media, YouTube, your favorite podcast platforms, and on the all-new Church Security app. Well, good evening and welcome to the Church Safety and Security broadcast. I am James and uh, I'm joined tonight by, as usual, by my co-hosts, Mike and Paul. And uh, we are ready to rock and roll tonight, except Paul, your your mic is on mute again. <laughs> I muted it when I stood up a minute ago. <laughs> so anyhow, if you've, if you've joined us, if this is the first time or, or the hundred, hundred and first time, <laughs> we probably get close. We've almost got enough. Yeah. Episodes. So, we're we're there. so this is, uh, this is our season six, episode two. And uh, if you're watching us at a later time on YouTube or one of the the uh, podcast channels, feel free to like and subscribe. And mm-hmm. as always, you can visit churchsafetyguys.com for great resources. Um, we have numerous resources free online. We also have uh, the one and only church security app uh, out there. And uh, again, much comp- uh, much content to help you navigate through church safety and security. And um, as always, we're a ministry, nonprofit ministry, and we do the best we can to to help coach folks and help them navigate some of that stuff. So almost every week now we're getting emails or phone right. calls and the three <laughs> of us are getting pulled in different directions and we're uh, it's it's great. It's a good blessing to have and uh, we're happy to be able to help. Just like Gumby. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, is there something coming up soon? Some kind of an event or something, James, Mike? I don't think so. I think it's I think <laughs> closer to you, James, than it is to Mike or I. But well, about I think it's about five miles down the road. There's a uh, <laughs> I can't even I can't even go with it. So what Paul's talking about is the the Church Security Essentials Conference that we're doing. It is October second in Columbus, Ohio. Um, you're welcome to, to join us. We still have a limited number of tickets left and, uh, we're looking forward to, to meeting everyone and, and having a great day of fellowship and learning. And, um, <clears throat> I bought my ticket. I have stuff. my airline ticket. I am confirmed. So good it's to kinda, go. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. So <laughs> we found out, I found out actually yesterday, um, we're we're gonna have our entire uh, entire CSG group there. So Jason will be there. He's mm-hmm. our tech guy that runs around in the background and does a tremendous amount of stuff for us. Uh, and uh, and then uh, actually Emily does a lot of social media filtering mm-hmm. and stuff. She's actually gonna be there with her husband and and family too. So nice. Um, so a whole her job together. That's a first. Yep. It may actually tear a hole in reality as we know it. <laughs> well, I asked her husband. It's pretty funny. I think we're we're pretty decent friends. But I asked her husband if she can if he can help keep all of the the signature hounds away from us. So, <laughs> you fly <the> water. <laughs> and he's like, "Bro, I got you." So I'm like, I'm over in the corner, know. feeling lonely. I'm yeah. so lonely. <laughs> so it's it'll be um, it's definitely a lot of fun if you have um, if you haven't bought your ticket you need to go do that and uh, you can get to that ticket site through churchsafetyguys.com if you go to the the website at the top of the page there's a link that says 2021 conference mm-hmm. and um, we're we're looking at next year um, we've had a lot of folks ask us to duplicate the conference in different places which is exciting I'm not sure 
if that's going to happen, we're still, we're still kind of seeing how Columbus pans out. And um, for sure, I think next year is going to be a really busy year too, because we've had a lot of, a lot of church conferences and a lot of folks reach out to us and say, Hey, can you come, come down to this conference and, um, and hang out? So it'll be fun. I, uh, we got, I mean, we're up to, what is it? Four five invites now for next year that were, yeah. that were, that people would either like to see this conference, like to have us at their conference. It's, it's pretty amazing what God's doing. For sure. So definitely you want to, um, you want to, go to the website, pick up your ticket. I know, um, again, it's, it doesn't seem, it seems like it's a far ways away cause it's October 2nd, but we really only have about five weeks. So, yeah. um, we still have, I think we have a few VIP tickets left and, uh, we definitely have some general admission ones. So, uh, take the, take the opportunity to bring your church and, uh, we'd love to meet you guys and, and uh, spend time with you. So that's what we're we're doing. We're going to have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, national speakers there. Um, John Riley with General Response is gonna, is going to come down from Michigan, and uh, and he's going to be talking about de-escalation. Uh, Dr. Brian Patterson is talking about uh, is a good friend of mine, and he's talking about mental health. And then um, we have several other other topics. Mike and I will be talking about leadership and. And, um, or Mike's going to be talking about leadership and <laughs> we're still working through that one. No, yeah. I'm joking. Oh, we'll figure it out. We're, we're, no, we don't really have to figure it out. We know what we're talking about. It's, <laughs> it, we're going to detail a lot of the different things that we have covered in, in several of the books that are already out. For sure. And we'll kind of talk on, unpack that, uh, those topics a bit. <laughs> and, uh, yep, yeah, there's one. I'm looking forward to talking about interpretive church, uh, interpretive dance and how it applies to church safety. So uh, stay tuned for that. It should be exciting. Did you rent the stage? <laughs> Paul's, Paul's going to spend some time talking about uh, interpretive dance and how it, I, I, let me pencil that in on the, on the schedule. He'll have a, we'll, we'll give him about five minutes and then if he doesn't, uh, if he doesn't perform, yeah, we'll we'll do the old hook off the stage routine for him. Nice, so, fun times. So anyhow, we can uh, we can jump into our our topic for this evening. So we want to want to revisit. We've talked about it before, but we want to revisit the topic of um, first responders and the connection with first responders and and church safety and security. And so. Um, I came across this gentleman and, and I really appreciated uh, his story, his family story and his ministry. So um, without, uh, without further eloquence, I will bring in uh, Mr. Eric Bauer from Shield of Hope. So thanks for joining us tonight, Eric. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, Even though here is in central Texas, I mean, it's all relative, right? Because of... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Technology. Yeah. <laughs> so for the for the sake of those that I, I I think I actually found your site and connected with you through um, uh, my buddy Jimmy Meeks. I think I think he has your ministry listed on his site as well. And so I started kind of going through some of what your ministry does, and I th I think it's fantastic. I think it's awesome yeah. that that you have that um, that passion and that heart. Um, but why don't we go ahead and start with uh, just your background, your experience, and kind of what what prompted you to, to go with the ministry, and then tell us a little bit about the ministry. Great. So I right out of high school, I joined the Air Force. Um, it was uh, October of 2001, so it was right after September 11th. Uh, though I had already been planning to go in, it, that just kind of was the time, and it, that was a crazy time, uh, obviously, for a lot of reasons. And uh, when I went in, I went in as security forces, which is the Air Force version of uh, military police. Mm -hmm. And I spent six years, had an opportunity to go to different places like North Dakota and Korea and, and, and get deployed. And then uh, when that time was coming up, I uh, just felt the calling to continue into law enforcement. And so it was a pretty easy uh, change right into from you know, military law enforcement into civilian law enforcement. And so I did that and joined a police department in Central Texas and where I've been a police officer now uh, for about 13 years. Wow. Um, 
when I started it. Howdy, neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> When I started in law enforcement, um, I didn't know the Lord. Uh, I grew up and I, and I knew uh, the church that I went to. I went to a, a Catholic church and I knew the Lord. Um, I knew that Christ had died for my sins. I knew all of those things. Um, but at, at the end of the day, uh, I, I didn't really know the Lord. I didn't have a relationship with Christ. And so when I got into to civilian law enforcement, um, it just really went kind of down a dark road. Um, started having to deal with a lot of things that were uh, that I wasn't used to being around a lot of trauma, a lot of exposure to, to just uh, a lot of evil, a lot of, a lot of terrible things. And so that really just brought me down a bad path to where honestly, I just, I really just kind of started to hate people. I started, uh, to not want to be around, uh, others, um, and just really had a difficult time. And it really put a strain on my wife and I's marriage, um, to the extent that, uh, that with some other things, uh, led to uh, her wanting to, um, get a divorce. And so, Really, at that time, it was just more of um, I, I really just became to a place where I recognized that uh, there was nothing I could do to fix my situation. I couldn't do anything in my own power anymore. Um, and I really just gave my life to Christ. And uh, from that point on, just started living for the Lord. Um, it just totally changed my life radically. And an opportunity came up back in 2014. Uh, where I was able to go to uh, on a mission trip to Honduras uh, with the church that we were involved with at the time. And uh, I didn't really know why I was uh, being called to go. I just wanted to be obedient. I just wanted to go, um, you know, in blind faith. If, if the Lord wanted me to do it, then I, then I would go. And mm -hmm. so uh, he provided the means um, to be able to do it in a very short amount of time. And that was somewhat of my confirmation to go. And so I went and uh, really had a, a great time. Um, you know, I've been to other countries, so I'm not um, I'm not ignorant to to how we how blessed we are here in the United States. But um, the Lord just was really working on my heart. And so a few months later, uh, in June of 2014, I had an opportunity to go back again. And this time, the individual that uh, was kind of our host and and we were staying at his house and he was translating. Uh, he was telling me his story about how he used to run drugs for cartels and how he spent time in federal prison. And that's where he met the Lord. And when he got deported back to Honduras, he started evangelizing. And so uh, we kind of had a little bit of a unique bond, um, you know, me being a police officer and him being a, a convicted felon. <laughs> and um, so one night he, he said, hey, you know, the officers down here, they're really uh, they have a hard time and a lot of them are corrupt. And maybe you should share your story with them. And so I was open to that. Uh, I didn't have, I uh, didn't really know what I would say if I came across that situation, but one night he brought them over and I just shared my testimony with them and spent about two hours with uh, three of their officers. And then the next morning, uh, the gentleman Israel, he had come up to me and said uh, that one of the sergeants uh, that was there that night before had called him and, and was crying and he wanted to give his life to Christ. And so uh, at that moment, I realized that this is what God was calling me into. And out of that, is what uh, ended up becoming Show of Hope Ministries. Awesome, that's uh, that's really a, an an awesome way. I always, uh, it's funny to me, and maybe I don't know, but if I guess maybe funny is not the right word, but it's it always impresses on me how uh, when we like your first missions trip, you you felt like if God wanted you to go, He would provide the money, and sure. so many times. I know for myself personally, I've been in that situation where I'm like, I really want to do this, but I don't know if I should. And I, you know, I pray and I'm like, Hey God, if you want, if you really want this to happen, you've got to do it. I, I can't do it because there's no way I can do that. And, um, you know, and God blesses that. And it's always encouraging to see that I think in other, other people, um, you know, my daughter, I think it was two years ago, my oldest daughter was going to go down to the Philippines, uh, with our church mission trip. And, uh, you know, she was going to spend some time uh, with a missionary that we support down there. And she really wanted to go. And she there was no way that she could afford the airfare because I think the whole trip cost, I want to say it cost like thirty two hundred dollars for, you know, your airfare and, and everything for the week. And um, I said, you know, my wife and I said to her, we're like, look, if God really wants you to go, he you know, he owns the cattle on a thousand, on a thousand hills. So he can sell a few of them and give you the cash. And, you know, we had, um, within literally within 48 hours of her saying, I'm trying to fundraise, I'll work for you. I'll do whatever. 
um, she had the money to go. And uh, people that she didn't even know, you know, were donating. And people that I had gone to college with 20 years ago were like, oh, your kid's going on a missions trip. Here's $100. You know, here's $200. And we're like, okay, <laughs> I guess I guess God's telling you that you need to trust him and he really wants you to go. So um, her- That's how I ended up in Texas. Yeah. Was, was legit, God said, and he provided means. And I was relocated with my uh, my company down here. For sure. Paul, you wanted to jump in there? So <clears throat> what you just shared is 90% of the stories I encounter as a chaplain is I got into law enforcement. I felt called to law enforcement. I started seeing dead bodies and I started seeing things that didn't make sense. And why did this per person survive? Why didn't they? I came home to my family and they talked about normal stress. And I was like, shut up. You, ha you don't even know. And <clears throat> that whole thing, and, and you were dealing with it during, with a lot of machismo around you. So how do I get help? I saw something that was too much. Um, recently in my area, we had a, a fatal accident. A uh, lady was pronounced at the scene and uh, the coroner called the officer that had worked it and said, hey, FYI, it was a double fatality. She was pregnant. She was just too, too early on for you to tell. And that stuff, it weighs, it hurts. And I, I know officers who've had career ending incidents because they found a dead body that looked like their daughter or something. And they went home and they, they literally had a panic attack and collapsed when they held their own daughter. And these are the realities that, and, and so anyone listening to this now or later, this is why you pray for your cops. And, you know, I've literally talked to officers that they do a death notification of a 16 year old boy to his mother, she collapses, they get family there, they go to the very next call and it's a barking dog call. And they want to choke the person because they're like, you know, this this dog won't this dog won't stop barking. Or my favorite, um, his bumper is is a foot over my property line. And they've just come away from doing something truly terrible that they just just came back from. Right. And these are the realities of law enforcement. And you go to war every day but you come home every night and the whiplash of that reality is really, really tough. And so it, it's one of these things that it, it's got to be talked about and it's got to be dealt with. And Christ is the only answer because when we can frame it in the perspective of God's plan and the fact that there are things we're not going to understand, but God is still God and he's still sovereign, that makes such a huge difference. And so that's why we pray for our cops. And that's why we invite them to church and we want them to have that hope because they get to the point they hate people. And you said that, Eric. And I literally I literally was talking to a police officer a few years ago and he's like, Paul, the entire world is nothing but meth heads and and, you know, and, and prostitutes and drug dealers and abusers. And I said, dude, you work nights in one of the worst parts of your city. Um, let's get you to, to some daylight. Let's have you meet some good people because your world is spiraling out of control. And he ultimately lost his marriage and some other situations, and he's in a much better state now. So that's an aside to the rest of this evening's conversation. But, but to the people listening at home, this is the bread and butter of what law enforcement deals with. And this is why we pray for them. And this is why there's crazy people that go out and minister to them. You know, and Mike, you've got opportunities. James, you've done it. It's something I do. And it's something that you do, Eric. And it, uh, I get excited uh, when I talk to, to my brothers that are out there doing it and making a difference. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because when you, when you come to that place of where you just feel like everybody's bad, and you kind of mentioned that, Paul, Mm -hmm. um, but the officer saying, hey, everybody's a meth head. Everybody's, uh, you know, and then part of the job, too, is in order to go home uh, at night, you you have to walk around with this lens that uh, every person that I meet is, is potentially somebody that wants to kill me. And so, you know, that's not a healthy uh, viewpoint when you when you're out in public. And so uh, it really does. Um, it really does kind of turn off this. Uh, there's this internal switch that I call it uh, that it shuts off this emotional uh, part of your, uh, of who you are and you just become very detached so that you can deal with the trauma and the things that you see. And then the problem is though, when you go back home, there's no way to turn that back on. And then it creates many issues within the, within the family. Um, but where Christ comes in is that, uh, after he changed my heart, mm -hmm. I no longer had, uh, I didn't hate that person. I wasn't aggravated with that person. And instead what I felt was, um, 
I, I just felt uh, I felt really bad, and, and I felt so sorry uh, for a lot of the people that I was dealing with. Um, my heart was broken for them because I could see that they didn't know the Lord. And that's why they're in the positions that they're in and they're doing the things that they're doing. Um, and I recognize that because I used to be hopeless and I used to be in that place where I didn't know um, and I had no, no joy and nothing to live for. And so recognizing that and then um, really just, you know, really broke my heart. And so that's how it changed my mind towards them is now, well, I have an opportunity uh, to be a light in the darkness and I have an opportunity um, to share the hope and the joy that I now have in Christ with somebody else. Amen. And that's, I, I've literally seen it, and, and then guys, we'll, James, Mike, will come back to to wherever we're going with this. But I've got to I've got to just say this for a minute because that's where ministry happens. I've literally seen officers pray. I've been pulled out of cop cars to pray with homeless people. I've I've literally had officers pull into the pull into the sally port at the jail and go take all the time you need and get out and talk to the jailers and smoke a cigarette because that believing officer knows that ministry is happening in the front seat of that car, and. I've had God set those appointments. I've, I prayed with a Hispanic woman earlier this year through an interpreter. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to light a fire in these young officers where they don't go, dude, you've got to meet my chaplain. No, 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 no. You know, let me get you some matches too. You can do this on your own and, and prayer. And to me, this is such a huge part of this. And so um, prayer is such a huge aspect of this. I'm like, you guys are, literally the, the first to hear because you're hearing it come over the radio. The, the first people to know is the dispatchers and then you, and you're hearing there's a baby that's not breathing. Um, this person's fighting for their life. These people are drowning. Pray, stop and pray in Jesus name and ask him to intervene. And I, I literally was with a young officer one night uh, less than a year ago and there was a baby not breathing. It was about three. It wasn't a baby it was not breathing. And they were concerned something was lodged in the airway. He's a Christian. I'm a Christian. We start praying. The next thing over the radio is uh, EMS is on site. Baby is conscious and breathing and trying to get them to give it something to drink. And that's the God we serve. And it's as a, a comic part of this. And, and James and, and Mike, you guys have been in and around cop cars and doing these things. It's happened so many times that God has moved that I've joked about praying something ornery and had guys go, don't you dare. I have seen God answer your prayers. Don't you dare. And that's the God we serve. And we, we want to make a difference. And if I ever do anything correctly, I want to light that fire in young police officers where they stay married and they stay behind the badge because we need them more than we ever have. And they, and they make a difference because you may have arrested somebody 15 times, Eric, but if you can, if you can give them the hope of Christ, odds are you never will again. I don't know anything else that can fix that. So anyway, I, I, uh, the last couple of episodes, if you've been watching them, I have been recovering from COVID. So I've been sort of a zombie and mostly on mute. And tonight I think I'm back, but anyway, so yes, I love it. That's awesome. For sure. So, um, we'll go ahead and, uh, I think for sake of time, we'll go ahead and take a quick break. But when we come back, I do want to talk, uh, with Eric about shield of hope, the ministry marriage, and then the help for heroes component, um, because I think that, um, as Paul mentioned before, I think a big component from uh, from a church aspect is helping officers understand and connect with um, with help, with support. And I think that I see a I see a lot of parallels with safety and security and helping churches reach the community. But I think that the folks that are in much of the time when we talk about safety and security in in a the church, we're talking about protecting and serving the operations of the church. And that's what we're, that's what we're supporting. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time in my mind, I've just thought, look, you know, if there was any ministry that the safety team inside the church could do to the community directly outside, it would be the first responders and the folks that, um, you know, maybe they can relate, relate with a little bit because, you know, in a sense, you know, those that serve in church safety and security, a lot of times they're officers, you know, firefighters, EMTs, et cetera. And, um, and they understand, you know, how, how that, uh, that interaction works and that sort of thing. So um, I want to jump into that. We'll go ahead and take a quick uh, sponsor break and then we will be right back with you. So uh, don't go anywhere. With over 50 years of experience with religious and nonprofit organizations, Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates understands that your congregation is different from a traditional business. 
We're here to fulfill your needs, coming to you while creating a personal plan for your budget and size. From your local community to around the globe, we are advocates for you. Thomas Alexander Insurance and Associates, your partner in service. Nobody thinks it will happen to them, but with over 2,000 emergency phone calls per month to our independent program attorney answered hotline, it's closer to home than you think. At U.S. Law Shield, we give you exclusive access to our 24-7, 365 emergency hotline, not a call center, direct access to our network of independent program attorneys. With a price point of only $10.95 per month and unlimited attorney hours for criminal and civil defense, U.S. Law Shield provides you with unparalleled service and protection where it matters most. No other program comes close. We believe an educated member is an empowered member. We do this by providing educational resources featuring seasoned attorneys, firearms instructors, law enforcement, and experts in all areas of self-defense law. We at U.S. Law Shield believe peace of mind should come with simple and affordable protection. Welcome to the Church Safety Guys broadcast. The Church Safety Guys help church and place of worship safety and security teams all over North America through our broadcasts, online communities, conferences, trainings, resources, and the all-new Church Security app. Download it today. Help us continue to reach churches by supporting our sponsors, purchasing our resources, and consider becoming a ministry partner by making a monthly or one-time donation. Remember to like, subscribe, and share this broadcast with your team. And now, back to the broadcast. Hey guys, so welcome back to the uh, Church Safety and Security broadcast. Uh, if you just joined us at a uh, on the on the broadcast, feel free to like and share. And if you join us at another time, feel free to click the subscribe button in the lower right hand corner. And as always, you can visit our our website at churchsafetyguys.com uh, for resources 
and uh, information on the upcoming Church Security Essentials Conference in Columbus, Ohio. So we're talking with Eric Bauer. Uh, he is with Shield of Hope Ministries. It's a um, nonprofit organization that he started. And uh, I want to kind of jump into some of your roles because I, I noticed on your website um, you have uh, kind of a ministry category and um, also a marriage category and then a help for heroes. So can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so um, we have three main uh, areas of our ministry. The ministry part, which uh, involves our help for heroes, um, which I have a Married to the uh, Badge podcast that my wife and, do, my wife and I do. Um, then we have our missions where uh, we do stuff with the officers in Honduras uh, and our Light in the Darkness campaign for them. And then our marriage um, conferences that we do for first responders every year. Awesome. So which, um, why, I guess, why did you, why did you pick those options as for things to invest your time in? Cause there's always with first responders, I know there's always a lot that you could do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what made you, what made you look at marriage and, um, missions? Well, you mentioned going to Honduras, so you had right. that, that connection, but, uh, marriage and then help for heroes. What, what got you into that? Yeah, so depending on what statistics you look at, and they're all over the place as far as the percentages, but the the, the worst that I've seen is uh, in just in law enforcement alone, we have divorce rates as high as eighty percent, and so yeah. it's a it's an extremely uh, you know difficult thing that uh, that a lot of first responders, especially officers, deal with and and, and get into, and so. Um, it, to us, it was just kind of very obvious that was an area that we needed to hit. Uh, more importantly, it was it, it's exactly where the Lord led us. Uh, we did our first marriage conference the first, uh, a few years ago. Wow. And my wife and I, uh, as we were standing up on stage and, and putting on this conference and, and being the guest speakers, uh, she pointed out that, you know, her and I had never actually even been to a marriage conference ourselves. Um, and we've been married 19 years now. And so... Um, you know, what I told them is that n nothing I have to say and, and nothing legitimizes me uh, apart from Christ. And so uh, whatever it is that the Lord gives me to say, that's what I speak to them. And, and, that, and that's what, what gives it the authority in that. Um, but yeah, because the, the marriage is, it's such a difficult thing. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time in our job uh, being taught and trained on how to go home safe at night. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, uh, depending on what statistics you're looking at, you could be anywhere from three or four times more likely to commit suicide uh, than be killed in the line of duty. And so we spend all this time dealing with the duty end of it, and we spend zero training and zero time in, in investing into the family, investing into the mental health. And so um, that was something that was very important to us that we wanted to make sure uh, that we spent a lot of time uh, and effort in, into those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to speak on the, uh, the help for heroes, I had an opportunity uh, in our department to be a part of our full-time peer support team, and I learned so much uh, in that. And one of the things that I learned a lot about was trauma. Um, I'm not licensed, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a mental health professional or anything like that, um, but I had an opportunity uh, to counsel with and work with a lot of uh, my brothers and sisters uh, in the uniform. And um, you know, one of the things that was just eye-opening to me was that we were constantly dealing with people that were in crisis, meaning you know, somebody was uh, having marital issues, their marriage was falling apart. Um, they're using poor coping mechanisms such as alcohol um, to deal with the trauma and the stress and, or maybe they, they're under investigation for something. And so, um, but we were always getting people in this kind of, um, you know, this kind of a, a state uh, and it really just broke my heart. And so what, what we did was we developed this health mm -hmm. program where we provide five free sessions of EMDR trauma therapy to first responders uh, to include their spouses um, uh, free of charge. And so it's been an amazing program. Uh, we've been able to get a few people through it and, it and it really does change their life. Amen. That's awesome. Paul, you wanted to jump in? Well, and there's, there's so many directions I could take this. So um, people don't realize, and you just said it, and it's this dirty little secret of the law enforcement community um, you end up feeling like you fail somebody and you didn't get there fast enough. Somebody wouldn't get out of your way. You got to the scene and you misunderstood something. You got to the scene and you didn't find a body and you found out later the person died. And, and some of it is the alpha male, I can do anything personality. And some of it is just taking home other people's baggage. And 
you you see the worst every single day for your entire shift you see the worst of other people's lives and then you want to come home and you just want some peace and quiet in a white picket fence and you get home and and your kids are talking about they want an iphone and and so and so timmy got in trouble at school and it's so easy i had a man tell me he was high ranking in his department he snapped at a young officer that had saw his that had seen his first dead body the kid thought it was a, an MVA. Turns out it was a suicide uh, by gunshot wound to the chest that turned into an MVA, a motor vehicle accident. And the guy, this man began to open up to me and say, he goes, I think you need to talk to this kid because I've got nothing for him. And I sat there and looked at him and the Holy Spirit was like, just shut up and wait. I mean, that's just where I was at. Right. And then he goes, he goes, Paul, I've realized I don't know how to cope with this. And so when I, when he started talking to me about this, I told him to suck it up. And he said, and then he kind of looked at me like, what the heck? Because now, and Mike really unpacked this for us one time, what, a year ago, year and a half ago, we can talk about mental health and we can take mental health days. But I grew up in a generation, uh, all of us grew up in a generation where you didn't talk about that. And and it's even so much sore within a machismo environment. So to really, really quickly finish the story, this high ranking uh, officer within his department and I began to talk about the fact that he was a bear when he went home and he screamed at his family. and. Um, I, that, you know, I've talked to officers that have punched holes in walls and they, they don't know how to deal with the things they've seen and they feel like they're a failure or they see corruption or they know, they know that they've got a child molester or a drug dealer dead to rights, but they cannot prove it. You know, they know right. what they know, but they can't, they can't prove it in court. And, uh, I'll, sh I'll share two more quick things because this is so pertinent to what you do. And I love these ministries. I'm going to go really quick and then I'm done. I promise guys <laughs> was, I had an officer turn to another officer at an event and he said, he said, Paul saved my life a couple of times. And I stopped and I'm thinking I've fought for a few officers and I've been in some hairy situations, but I don't remember anything like that with him. And later I said, man, did, did something happen that I don't remember? And he goes, no, dude, I was going to kill myself. And straight up, you you walked me through a dark time in my life a couple of times. Thirdly, and this is so pertinent to what you're doing, um, officer, alpha male, big dude, you know, six five, you know, two hundred plus pounds, um, end up in a car with him. We're driving. Guy starts crying, like tears are gushing, and I'm like, "You've got me where you want me, Lord." And for the second time in his career, he had held a young girl as she died. Super traumatic for a guy, not cool to deal with, something that the average guy will never see in his life. And then you're supposed to go home at night and play with your kids. And what ended up happening was he's like, I failed these two girls. And I'm not that smart, Eric. I just sat there and I'm like, I'd like to phone a friend. Could the Holy Spirit give me something? And I'm sitting there listening. And I realized what the Lord had for me I ended up turning to him and I said, I said, so are you a, a doctor, a nurse, an EMT, a paramedic? And he's like, obviously not. And I said, but you are a believer. And he said, yes. And I said, as they left this life for the next, were you praying for them? And he said, yes. And I said, so a believing man of God was holding them and talking to them and comforting them and praying for them. And I said, the word of God says we are escorted by angels from this life to the next to be, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with God. And he's like, absolutely. And I said, you were there for the handoff. And he's like, man. And like, like I was good at this. And I'm like, no, dude, it's, it's the Holy spirit. I had nothing. <laughs> and, but we, we prayed about that in that moment. And that's those rubber meets the road moments that let people go home and, and to begin to heal. And th this is things that happen to believers. Like these guys are already, the, a lot of these guys I work with are already believers and they carry this baggage. So anyway, I love what you do. Thanks. Mike, did you want to jump in and throw well, it over I, I echo the sentiment and, and it's a great, great story there, Paul. I mean, it's just amazing how um, God can put us in the right place at the right time. And we don't even necessarily recognize it until after, as, as you said. But I think there, there's so often in, whether it's in church safety, whether it's as, as an immediate responder, whether it's a, as a first responder, um, you mentioned it, Eric, the, the coping mechanisms, choosing the wrong things. And I think there's, there's times where certainly we all experience the, the different degrees of, of, of that with adrenaline dumps and things like that that we get from some things that happen just on our Sunday morning. And I'm sure there's things that we've encountered that invade our personal lives um, as well, certainly to a, a much lesser extent. 
Um, but in that, I, I'm wondering if you want to unpack a little bit more, Eric, about that marriage piece, that that bringing it home, that how are you reaching the spouses? How are you reaching the folks next to it? And, I, and, and maybe an opportunity to tee up your podcast there as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. You know, in my time in peer support, one of the things that I re- recognized and, and came to realize uh, as I prayed about it is that um, we're never going to be able to fix anybody when they're already at, at their top of their crisis. And so the thing or the idea is how can we get them while they're down here? before it ever gets up to where now we have some major issues going on. Um, and what I come to realize is it really starts with the family because in my, my per, uh, particular situation with my wife and I, you know, if something's going on with me that's not right, my wife is gonna notice that long before anybody else does. So if people at work are starting to notice that something's going on, that tells me that it's been going on at home for a long time, well before it ever came over uh, to where other people started noticing it. And so then the other component to that is my wife also has a greater uh, deal of influence over me than anybody else. You know, my wife's like, hey, you know what? We're going. You're going to get some help and I'm going to put you in the car. If I got to drag you myself, you know, that's going to have a little bit more of an impact. (laughs) That's going to have a little bit more of an impact um, than your buddy just saying, hey, man, you know, I think you should go talk to somebody. And so with those two things, I I feel like if we can um, if we can can train and educate and, and provide resources to the spouses and to the family members, um, it just puts us in a such in a much better position to, to deal with things at the, you know, at the on start of it versus it's gotten way out of control. Um, because the reality of it is, is you're not ever going to be able to remove trauma from the job. The, the trauma is always going to be there. So we have to learn new ways to, to mitigate that trauma and how to deal with it. Um, and of course, EMDR, I feel like is, is such a, a vital component to that. Um, as well as a resource. And so when these spouses and these family members recognize like, hey, this, you know, something's not right here. And I tell officers all the time, look, you, this is going to happen. You, you can't avoid it. It's going to happen. Um, certainly if you're uh, a follower of Christ, it's different, uh, but your brain is still going to process trauma uh, or fail to process trauma in the same way that a non-believer is, is going to, to do it. And so uh, you really have to key in on, on that fact because uh, the unprocessed trauma is not just going to one day randomly uh, process itself. And so there are things that you can do to, to help uh, uh, help that happen. For sure. Remember the way. I think it, it's it, as, as believers, that's that's the option. Remember the way that that the Lord Jesus kind of put before us. It's his way. It's it's where are we going? It's where where are those that were perhaps um witness to or go before us that we know as believers where they're going and i think that's a big piece and then something my pastor continues to say is when you're in that worst uh point is win the day just do what it's necessary to win the day in other words find a positive out of that day win that day not by resorting to those coping mechanisms but finding something to win that day Tomorrow's still going to be there, and that's that point. I think it, you raised is that suicide component, Paul. I think it, you mentioned as well is there's there's that risk that's there, but you got to get by that first day, and it's each a day at a time. And there's that those individual footsteps. So um, it's win that day and remember the way is what my pastor likes to say. Yeah, for sure. I, I want to make two really quick comments because that's awesome. I love the win the day, Mike, and I'm going to use that with my guys. <laughs> that's awesome. And because I love little sayings, as you guys know, and, and when we when we can have a healthy a healthy coping mechanism, it's, it's incredible. But I, I want anybody who's never been a first responder in the military, never dealt with this kind of trauma to pause and think as men, we base ourselves a lot of times off the success of what we do for a living. When you've arrested the same person 15 times and the woman that you pulled 36 times to get away from her abuser, you're now helping carry her body out. It's really hard to feel successful or the guy that you had on 13 counts of something walks because he goes state's evidence for something else. It's really hard to feel successful about your job. And it's I've actually told guys you have to find your in Christ, by the way, is the answer. Right but you have to find your feeling of success outside of the badge because you're never, ever, ever, ever going to find it as a cop. Just just because, it's just not gonna happen. You'll have moments, 
but those moments will almost never triumph over the other moments. And it's, it's, it's when people say it's thankless, that doesn't even touch it. So yes, those are, those are very good points. For sure. I was just gonna, I was gonna mention one thing and I, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I have uh, a plethora of stories running through the back of my mind, but um, you know, I served, I served as an EMT firefighter in a small community for about 10 years. And um, one of the most impactful calls that I ever went on um, was a, a call for a, um, uh, I think it was a 17 year old who had a uh, gunshot wound. Mm-hmm. And that's how the, you know, that's how the call came out. And I was one of the first people on the scene. Well, what they didn't realize or what, what dispatch didn't communicate was that that 17 year old with the gunshot wound was actually self-inflicted. Um, and in our community, you know, we have a big, it was a big rural community, big hunting community. And my thought, you know, my perception to the buildup of arriving there was, um, this is going to be a hunting accident. Like maybe he was cleaning his gun and it accidentally went off and he's still, uh, you know, running around and I'm going to bandage, you know, you always play the scenarios in your mind. You guys know what I'm talking about. So we get there and it was as far bad of a scenario as, as could possibly be. He was laying on the ground. He had taken a, um, uh, a 357 and actually shot himself in the chest with it. And um, <clears throat> so the guy, my partner, the guy that was actually with me knew him in high school. Mm. And all of a sudden he didn't recognize him when he did recognize him. I had to literally pull him away from his friend on the ground. And, um, you know, it was multi, multi ALS response. We had probably five or six, uh, different departments there uh, because everybody just came out of the woodwork and, you know, uh, we're, we're debating calling life flight. Um, I ended up doing, I think I ended up doing compressions on him for about 45 minutes to the hospital before an ER doc called it and said, there's, you know, there's nothing. He, he shot himself in the chest. So you're literally doing what his heart should be doing, but isn't because it's not there anymore. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting to me is, you know, that always, obviously that always stays with me. We went through, um, trauma, uh, counseling after like our entire department did. And back then, I mean, that was the nineties back then, you know, it's like trauma counseling is pretty much just sitting around talking. It's not even, you know, it wasn't necessarily specific to one thing or another. Um, but I'll never forget when I got home and being exhausted and coming down off that adrenaline, you know, dump from that whole, call and everything, um, you know, rocked the, it rocked the community. And I remember my dad sitting down next to me and, uh, my dad has always had an interest in EMS and fire and stuff like that. And, uh, he sat down next to me, didn't say a word. I was sitting there, you know, drinking a cup of coffee. He sat down and he's like, Hey, you want to talk about it? And that's all he said. And to me now looking back on that, I'm like, that is the most powerful thing that he could have said to me in that time because he wasn't there. He didn't understand Mm -hmm. what, what emotions, what I was going through, but he knew that I was judging myself as to, you know, could I have done something different? Could I have actually saved this guy? And uh, I don't think, you know, my dad and I have always been close because of that. I don't think if I asked him today, he would remember even saying that to me. Um, But I remember it and I remember him just being there. And I said, no, dad, I said, I think I'm okay. I just need to process and kind of go through some of this stuff. And he's like, okay, well, if you want to talk about it, I'm, you know, I'm here, I'll talk about it with you. And it was probably a couple of days, you know, when I said, Hey, you know, we were working outside doing lawn work and, and uh, landscaping. And I said, I just started talking to him and, you know, and he was available. And I think, a lot of times in relating to our conversation tonight, I think a lot of times churches and people that go to church because they don't understand the dynamics that you guys have talked about with first responders and with the trauma and the stress and everything. I think a lot of times they feel alone because they don't know how, like, how do you relate to that? You know, I can relate to someone and understand responding to an emergency because I've done that. You know, I've been there even though I don't do that. Um, but from a church aspect, I think it's kind of challenging sometimes because they're like, well, gee, I've never dealt with 
doing CPR on somebody for 45 minutes? How does that impact? And, you know, if you go to the, the churches that have had major issues, you know, we've, we've had guests on from Sutherland Springs, Texas, and we've talked with them about different, you know, active shooter situations and stuff like that. You'll find that the mental health component is far more important and carries on much further you know, as a general rule, because it, it just does when it's all said and done, it's not just about, you know, what's going on right now, but it's the, the, um, I don't know, the cloud of, of mental health that covers after. So I appreciate, I guess I'm, I'm just saying all that to say, I agree with you. I, I know where you're coming from. And I appreciate the fact that you and your wife have, um, found that ministry because, there are folks out there like you that are, are ready to jump in and help others. And, um, you know, that's not something we see all the time. Um, right. so for sure. But did you guys want to, um, add anything else or jump in? Well, do you guys want me to close in prayer? Cause I'll make a comment before I close in prayer, but I'll leave it open to you guys between times. One more comment, I think, and uh, Eric, you, you, you talked a lot and we talk on this show a lot about deescalation and I just, I saw the point where you said is you, you're targeting reaching the folks before they escalate, before that trigger right. point where they're already elevated, they're already heated, they're coming in at that point and preventing that escalation to the tipping point. And I think that's, it's a really good visual that, that kind of struck me there and the parallel of what that is, of reaching the folks where they're at that point, coming alongside them is what we try to do with those in safety and security and really let them know that, hey, we have resources. We have different things that we're trying to do. You're doing that, whether that's in Honduras or whether that's folks uh, that, that wear the badge as well. And and it's amazing. And uh, I do like that you're, you you see through your own walk and through different things that you've, you've found the need to reach those folks at that point and that you're targeting that point very well. And I think um, looking at that and catering to those folks and catering to the spouses as well um, that's amazing because at the end of the day, if you're helping the spouse, you're helping the badge too, because if, yeah. if, if that conflict doesn't bubble up, that person is, is in the right mindset. Maybe they go home that day instead of coming into work with a troubled mindset and then a little split second and it, it changes the outcome. So I just see so much of that impact of what you can do impacting those spouses having an impact on saving lives because of what they could go in that day and not come home. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. I am good, sir. If you want uh, your, your closing, closing comments and pray us out, you're good to go. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to hit this a hundred miles an hour. I know a believing police officer. And when he ends up doing CPR or helping somebody, <clears throat> he's holding pressure. He's like, he's like, listen, Paul, if you're still alive, I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to do everything in my power to keep you alive. If you are no longer alive, it's above my pay grade. <laughs> and, he, and I love that because he's got a healthy mindset. James, you were you did CPR for 45 minutes and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt, there's nothing you could have done for that man because his heart didn't exist. It, it, being able to frame something in your mind is super important. Number two, <clears throat> uh, Mark Gunger, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage impacted my wife hugely. We'd been married about uh, eight years. We were trying to figure out, you know, where's the shifter on this thing? Where's the e-brake? Like we were trying to figure out marriage. We'd, we'd both been married before she'd lost a husband. I'd had a wife leave and we, we loved God and we loved each other, but we might as well have been speaking two different languages. Went to one of Mark's conferences. We laughed to the point that we cried and came out of there realizing we might as well be two different species, but now we started to understand each other. Annually, Eric, we watch, we rewatch about the four and a half hour DVD set. And my wife will say, pause that. I never understood you until that moment because everybody's, <clears throat> everybody's gray matter is different. How we right. think and approach things and, and how, what's our nature, what's our nurture to talk about Jason Hevner and his background and how he talks about things. It's huge. And I literally put it, I, I go buy it anywhere I can get it. And I put it in the hands of every young couple that's in law enforcement, that's a first responder. And I say, listen to me, I can save you a lot of heartache. Into this month, I've been married 18 years and I wasn't going to leave, but we were grinding gears and stripping the transmission and trying to figure out how to do this right. I'd love it for you guys just to go on eBay and buy a copy for 12 or 13 bucks. Give it a listen. You'll laugh. 
Maybe you'll grab a couple of gold nuggets. I had him on my podcast. Number three, there are things that officers deal with that it's hard to come home that maybe their spouses can't or don't want to hear. And this is back, back to what you do. <clears throat> I literally talked to a police officer that pulled up to a wreck. There's a half dozen dead bodies. Everybody is graphically dead. And he sees a man who's intact. He runs over it, no pulse. He begins to do CPR and he now knows what the inside of a human brain tastes like. And I sat with him in his department and I looked at him and I was, I was fixing his computer because that's what I do as part of my ministry. And I opened my mouth and I closed my mouth and I said, I called him by his name and I said, no one should know what a human brain tastes like. And he right. looked at me and nodded and I said, I'm so sorry, brother, that that happened to you. And that this was recently and this was probably June. And um, I said, I'm so sorry that that happened. I wish people understood that that's a reality. And then they make fun of you at the gas pump when you pull back up to the gas pump from that call and you're standing there thinking, I wish I didn't know what that tasted like. I wish I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't, I wish I could go home and shower and, um, and maybe shower my soul. And then some goober pulls up and goes, all I ever see you guys do is stand around. And then they wonder why, why law enforcement goes, dude, I could drive a truck or flip a burger and make more money. That's the realities of law enforcement. And I love it when people, and it's James's heart, it's Mike's heart. It's huge in your heart, brother, to, to try to make a difference. And I think it's also one of the biggest reasons that officers get so jaded. And sometimes they, they literally, I've had people go, that cop was so cold to me at the scene of this event. And I'm like, he had nothing for you. You don't understand that yeah. cop coming on empty. And so, yeah, sir, we've got just a couple minutes and then I'd love to pray out. I'd love to have you uh, throw a thought in there and uh, maybe a website, a link, a resource. Yeah. Um, no, you, I was just going to say real quick, you're absolutely right. Uh, but, but that's just, uh, you know, it's part of, of life is you never really know where somebody's at. Um, mm -hmm. And so just as Christ had met us wherever it was that we were, uh, we need to do a better job of trying to meet and know the people uh, where they are because we don't know someone's circumstance uh, going into it um, with strangers and as officers, uh, what we tell the guys in Honduras all the time is that, you know, God has called us into uh, to be a light in the darkness. And that's kind of what our big motto is. But, you know, Jesus said in John 12, 46, that he came into the world as a light. So whoever would believe in him would not remain in darkness. And that's what we that's what we try to share is we try to give that hope. And, and then also at the same time, as an officer, I also, too, have to recognize that that person, even though I'm in that moment, doesn't understand and doesn't know what I just went to. And so there's grace uh, and there's love mm -hmm. to be given in, in, in that moment. And that's another thing that we try to tell officers because I've been there. Um, I, I don't know how many times I walk into somewhere and someone's like, it was him or he did it or I didn't do it, you know, and, uh, it, and oh. things like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so uh, well, I really do appreciate you guys having us on. Um, we have a website, shieldofhope.org. Um, it's got all kinds of information about everything that, that you'd want to know about our ministry. Um, and we're always looking for people to, to want to jump on board and, and get involved and, uh, and help us in, in our mission. So. Hallelujah. All right. For Jensen, sure. Yeah. I, I, I just want to throw in there real quick. Definitely check out the, check out his website. Um, Eric's got some great stuff on there and he actually, he does a lot of uh, fundraising and equipment supplying to, uh, law enforcement in other countries, uh, specifically Honduras. And I love that too, that, uh, you know, they're, they're stepping up to try and show the love of Christ through, through equipment and something as simple as providing equipment to a, a, another department that's not, not in the United States. So definitely, I just want to, want to throw that out there, but definitely check out his website. There's some great resources on there and, uh, you won't certainly won't go wrong by, by checking it out. So Amen. thank you. But yeah, other than that, Paul, yeah, go ahead. I'm good. <laughs> this was fun guys. So yeah. definitely follow Lord God. I thank you for moments like tonight. I'm glad to feel well enough to enjoy it. Lord God, I ask that you would bless, bless Eric's ministry, Lord God, his ministries, Lord God, in this country, outside of this country, Lord God, you'd give him the words you would, you would give him the resources, Lord God. And I ask that you would, you would just, fill him not only with your peace with your joy lord god but we all have desires of our heart things that we are working through lord god even secret hurts and pains and ask that you would heal him in his life that you would guide and bless and protect his family lord god and 
just continue to increase his reach so that he can reach more people because lord god there is an entire generation of law enforcement that's lost and lord god that generation of law enforcement could reach so many hurting people because that's all they deal with every day so i thank you and i give you the honor and the glory in your son jesus name amen 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 so real quick we'll jump back um to just wrapping, wrapping everything up. But uh, if you get a chance, if you're interested, uh, visit the church security essentials uh, dot info for tickets on the conference coming up. Yep. And uh, you definitely, you don't want to miss that. And then as always feel free to visit church for additional resources. Um, if we can help you out in any way. And I always, I always say this, but all three of us are, are uh, more, more than willing to uh, chat with you about what's going on at your church. If you need a need a listening ear, or if we can help coach you through something, uh, feel free to reach out to us and let us know, and um, we'll definitely do the best we can. So next week we have uh, Glenn Owen on with us. He should be coming in. Um, he's a fellow Ohioan, and uh, he was actually rec recommended to us uh, by another. Uh, individual that we had on. He's been doing church safety and security, I think for close to 20 years. So uh, it'll be, yeah, he's a, he, he's a great guy and uh, he's got a lot of experience. So you don't want to miss that. Um, we should have him on next week with us and um, we'll go from there. So uh, if we don't talk to you, we'll talk to you next week. So take care. God bless. Have a great week. Thank you for joining the Church Safety and Security broadcast with the Church Safety Guys, sponsored by Checker. We hope that you found it informative, and we appreciate your feedback. Be sure to share our broadcast with your teams. Join the discussion online, and for other great resources, download the Church Security app or visit our website at churchsafetyguys.com. Remember, keep a servant's heart a mindset of ministry, and Semper Disciplina. Always be training. Have a blessed week.